In this video, we'll cover part two of The Cold War Begins. The Cold War will deepen. Stalin, seeking oil concessions, broke the agreement to remove troops from northern Iran, and Stalin eventually backed down. But the Moscow's, Moscow's hardline policies in Germany, Eastern Europe, and the Middle East wrought psychological Pearl Harbor on the United States. The Americans were upset by the Kremlin's unwillingness to continue the wartime partnership. Attitudes on both sides had hardened. Truman's response to the Soviet challenges were the contain, was the containment doctrine, and this was his foreign policy. It was crafted by George Kennan in 1947, and this held that Russia, whether czarist or communist, was relentlessly expansionist and argued that the flow of Soviet power could be contained by firm and vigilant containment. This is reflected in the Truman Doctrine. Truman embraced Kennan's get-tough-with-Russia intellectual framework. He went before Congress on March 12, 1947 and asked for $400 million to bolster Greece and Turkey in support for those resisting communist aggression. Congress granted the money and thus the support for open-ended commitments of vast proportions. Exaggerating the Soviet threat, Truman pitched the message in charged language of a holy global war against godless communism to overcome any revived isolationism. Where to? This is a satirical view of the Truman Doctrine, showing that not all Americans were sure where the country's new foreign policy was taking them. There were threats in war-ravaged Western Europe, especially France, Italy, and Germany. They were in danger of being taken over from inside by the communist parties. And on June 5, 1947, the Secretary of State, George Marshall, invited the Europeans to get together and work out a joint plan for economic recovery. If they did, the United States would provide substantial financial assistance, and this cooperation eventually led to the creation of the European community. Under the Marshall Plan, uh, which was created uh, when the Allies met in Paris in July 1947, to tr thrash out the details. The Marshall Plan offered the same aid to the Soviet Union and its allies, but under the terms the Soviet Union could not accept. It called for spending $12.5 billion over four years in 16 cooperating countries. Congress at first balked at this mammoth sum. It looked huge when it added the $2 million billion already provided for European relief. As the Cold War tensions escalate, Congress voted initial appropriations in April of 1948. The United States foreign aid, military and economic is shown from 1945 to 1954. The Marshall Plan basically provided aid to Europe for the rebuilding process. The Marshall Plan was a spectacular success. The U.S. dollars assisted the anemic Western European nations. It was an economic miracle that drenched Europe in prosperity, and it couldn't have happened without American funding. The communist parties in Italy and France lost ground as a result, and two countries were saved from communism. Truman, on May 19, 1948, officially recognized the state of Israel on the day of its birth. This antagonized the oil-rich Arabs who opposed such a state in the British Mandate Territory of Palestine, and this issue and conflict still, still exists today. This decision greatly complicated the United States and Arab relations. This is a picture of the Marshall Plan, Turning Enemies into Friends, a poster in 1950, uh, in, the in the photograph in Berlin, it reads, Berlin was rebuilt with help from the Marshall Plan. America begins to rearm as a result of the Cold War. The Soviet menace resulted in the creation of a huge national security apparatus. The National Security Act of 1947 created the Department of Defense, headed by a new cabinet office, the Secretary of Defense, and under the Secretary were civilian secretaries of the Navy, the Army, and the Air Force. These uniformed heads of each service were brought together as Joint Chiefs of Staff. This is a picture of the American motor of the latest type. It's a Russian cartoon showing the conquering Truman using U.S. money bags to induce dollar-hungry European nations to draw the American capitalistic chariot. This established the National Security Council as well to advise the President on security matters and the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, to coordinate the government's foreign fact-gathering. Congress authorized the Voice of America in 1948 to beam American radio broadcasts behind the Iron Curtain. They resurrected the military draft as well, 
conscription of selected young men from 19 to 25 took place. The selective service system shaped millions of young people's educational, marital, and career plans as a result. The United States decided to join the defensive European Pact, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, which is still in existence today. To bolster containment and to help reintegrate Germany, the treaty was signed in Washington on April 4, 1949. Twelve original signatories pledged to regard an attack on one as an attack on all and to respond with armed force if necessary. The Senate approved the treaty in July by a vote of 82 to 13. Membership boosted to 14 in 1952 when Greece joined and to 15 in 1955 by the addition of West Germany. The NATO Pact was epochal. This was a dramatic departure from American diplomatic convention. It was a gigantic boost for the European unification and a significant step in militarization of the Cold War. NATO became the cornerstone of all Cold, Cold War American policies towards Europe, and the pundits summed up NATO's threefold purpose, to keep the Russians out, the Germans down, and the Americans in. Meanwhile, Reconstruction was taking place in Japan, and this was simpler than Germany because it was a one-man show. MacArthur led the program for the democratization of Japan. The top war criminals were tried in Tokyo from 1946 to 1948, 18 were sentenced to prison terms, and 7 were executed. MacArthur's success was successful, and his Jap the Japanese cooperated to an astonishing degree. MacArthur dictated the Constitution, which was adopted in 1946. It renounced militarism and provided for women's equality. It introduced Western-style democratic government and paved the way for Japan's phenomenal economic recovery. This is a, a political cartoon titled Reaching Across the Atlantic in Peacetime, 1948. You can pause and read the description. Reconstruction in China was the opposite of Japan. Japan. It was a bitter civil war that raged between the nationalists versus the communists. Washington half-heartedly supported the nationalist government of Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek. Communists were led by Mao Zedong. The corruption and ineptitude of Chiang Kai-shek's regime eroded popular conference, uh, confidence in his government, and the communist armies forced Chiang Kai-shek in 1949 to flee to the island of Formosa, which is Taiwan. The collapse of the nationalist China was a major defeat for America and its allies in the Cold War. It was the worst to date. Nearly a quarter of the world's population, some 500 million, were swept into a communist camp. And the fall of China became bitterly partisan as an issue in the United States. The Republicans assailed Truman for having lost China and claimed that the Democrats had deliberately withheld aid from Chiang Kai-shek. More bad news in September 1949 was Truman announced that the Soviets had exploded an atomic bomb. To outpace the Soviets in nuclear weaponry, Truman ordered the development of the hydrogen bomb. The H-bomb was much more powerful than the atomic bomb, and Robert Oppenheimer led the group of scientists in opposition to the development of thermonuclear weapons. Albert Einstein declared, Annihilation of any life on Earth has been brought within the range of technical possibilities. The United States explored the first hydrogen device in 1952, and the Soviets countered with their first H-bomb explosion in 1953. The nuclear arms race entered perilously, a perilously competitive cycle, and was only constrained by the recognition that truly hot Cold War would destroy the world. This is a picture of an explosion by the hydrogen bomb in the test blast at Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands in 1954. The Korean volcano will erupt during this time period as well. New, this was a new shooting phase to the Cold War, June 1950, in former Japanese colony of Korea. After World War II, the Soviet troops accepted Japan's surrender north of the 38th parallel. American troops did so south of the 38th parallel. Both superpowers professed to want reunification and independence of Korea. As in Germany, each side helped set up rival regimes above and below the parallel. By 1949, both sides had withdrawn forces and left a bristling armed camp, and two hostile regimes were eyeing each other suspiciously. The explosion came on June 25, 1950. Spearheaded by Soviet-made tanks, North Korea and their army rumbled across the 38th parallel, and the South Korean forces pushed to Pusan in the south. 
Truman viewed the incident through the containment doctrine that any relaxation in America's guard would invite communist aggression. This is a picture of launching Apollo 11, which we'll discuss at a later time. This prompted a massive expansion of the U.S. military. The National Security Council Memorandum No. 68, also called NSC 68, recommended that the USA quadruple defense spending. Truman ordered a massive buildup well beyond what was necessary for Korea. The U.S. had 3.5 million men under arms, but they spent $50 billion per year on a defense budget, some 13% of the GNP. NSC 68 was a key document of the Cold War period. It marked the major step in militarization of the American foreign policy. It reflected a sense of almost limitless possibility that pervaded the post-war American society. It rested on the assumption that enormous, um, the enormous American economy could bear without strain the huge costs of a rearmament program. Said one NSC 68 planner, there is practically nothing the country could not do if it wanted to do it. Truman and the United Nations on June 25, 1950, obtained a unanimous condemnation of North Korea as an aggressor. The Security Council called all UN members, including the USA, to render assistance and to restore peace. Two days later, Truman orders the American air and naval units to support South Korea. He ordered General MacArthur's Japan-based troops into action alongside the beleaguered South Koreans, and so began the ill-fated Korean War. The United States' role was simply participating in the UN police action. In fact, the United States actually provided 88% of the UN contingents. MacArthur, who was appointed UN commander of the entire operation, took orders from Washington, not from the Security Council. MacArthur landed behind enemy lines at Incheon on September 15, 1950. He succeeded brilliantly, and the North Koreans scrambled back behind the sanctuary of the 38th parallel. The UN Assembly tacitly authorized the crossing by MacArthur. Truman ordered MacArthur northward as long as no armed intervention by Chinese or Soviets took place. The Americans raised the stakes in Korea and brought China into the dangerous game. This is a picture, a map we'll discuss in class, the shifting front in Korea. Chinese involvement would not, they would not sit by and watch the hostile troops approach the boundary between Korea and China. MacArthur boasted that he would not he would have the boys home by Christmas, and in November 1950, tens of thousands of Chinese volunteers fell upon his rashly overextended line and hurled the UN forces back down the peninsula. The war became a stalemate near the 38th parallel. MacArthur pressed for a drastic retaliation while Washington refused to enlarge an already costly conflict. Europe, not Asia, was the administration's first concern. The Soviet Union, not China, loomed as the more sinister foe. MacArthur sneered at the concept of a limited war. Truman bravely resisted calls for nuclear escalation. When MacArthur criticized the president's policies publicly, Truman had no choice but to remove insubordinate MacArthur from command on April 11, 1951. Many Americans criticized Truman's decision, and this reflected the popular passions of the Cold War at home. This is a picture called Truman Takes the Heat that has to do with the topic of the firing of MacArthur. The Cold War deeply shaped political and economic developments at home after World War II. A new anti-red chase was accelerated by fears of communist spies in the United States. In 1947, Truman launched the massive loyalty program. The Attorney General drew up a list of 90 supposedly disloyal organizations, and the Loyalty Review Board investigated more than 3 million federal employees, some 3,000 of whom either resigned or were dismissed, none under formal indictment. Individual states became involved, and loyalty oaths were demanded of employees, especially teachers. In 1949, 11 communists were brought before the New York jury for violating the Smith Act of 1940. This was the first peacetime anti-sedition law since 1798, and they were convicted by ad of advocating the overthrow of American government by force, and the defendants were sent to prison. And the Supreme Court upheld these convictions in Dennis versus the United States, court case in 1951. The House of Representatives in 1938 established the House on American Activities Committee, Committee, also known as HUAC, to investigate subversion. In 1948, Richard Nixon, an ambitious committee member, led the chase after Alger Hiss. He was a prominent ex-New Dealer 
He had distinct, was a dis distinguished member of the Eastern Establishment and was accused of being a communist agent in the 1930s. Hiss demanded the right to defend himself, and he dramatically met his chief accuser before HUAC in August of 1948. Alger Hiss denied everything, but was caught in many falsehoods. This is a picture of Richard Nixon, considered a red hunter during this time period. He was, Alger Hiss was convicted of perjury in 1950 and sentenced to five years in prison. Another example of the Cold War tensions was Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, who allegedly leaked atomic data to Moscow. They were convicted in 1951 of espionage and went to the electric chair in 1953. They were the only people in American history ever executed in peacetime for espionage. The sensational trial and electrocution combined with the sympathy, sympathy for the two orphaned children of theirs, began to sour some citizens against the Red Hunters. Was America really riddled with Soviet spies? Soviet agents did infiltrate some government agencies, though without severely damaging consequences. Some conservatives used Red Brush to tar anyone involved in social change as subversive, and the Red Hunt turned into a witch hunt. In 1950, Truman vetoed the McCarran Internal Security Bill, which authorized the president to arrest and detain suspicious people during internal security emergencies. Critics said that the bill smacked of the police state tactics, and Congress enacted a bill over Truman's veto. Senator Joseph McCarthy was the most dangerous practitioner of the demagogic anti-communism. In February 1950, he accused Secretary of State Dean Acheson from, of knowingly employing 205 communists. McCarthy never identified a single actual communist. His Republican colleagues encouraged him to attack. His rhetoric grew, grew bolder, as did his accusations. And he saw the red hand of Moscow everywhere. McCarthyism flourished in the seething Cold War atmosphere of su suspicion and fear. This is a picture of McCarthy mapping out a menace during the Army McCarthy hearings, which were televised in 1954. McCarthy was the most ruthless red hunter and did most damage to American traditions of fair play and free speech. Careers of countless officials, writers, and actors were ruined by low blow Joe. Politicians trembled in the face of such attacks, and at the peak of his power, McCarthy controlled the personnel policy in the State Department. This resulted in severe damage to the morale and effectiveness of professional foreign service. It deprived the government of a number of Asian specialists and damaged America's internal reputation, international reputation for fair and open democracy. He went too far when he attacked the U.S. Army. The military fought back in 35 days of televised hearings in the spring of 1954 in the Army McCarthy hearings. Up to 20 million watched the hearings. McCarthy publicly cut his own throat by parading his essential meanness and irresponsibility. The Senate formally condemned him for conduct unbecoming a member. And three years later, McCarthy died of chronic alcoholism. McCarthyism is a label for dangerous forces of unfairness and fear, which can be unleashed by a democratic society. The Cold War shaped American culture as well. Many interpreted the conflict between the capitalist West and the communist East in religious terms. Theologian Reinhold Niebuhr cast the Cold War as a battle between good and evil. This divided the world into two camps, children of light and children of darkness. The religious belief of any kind became distinguishing feature, a distinguishing feature of the American way. Congress in 1954 inserted the words under God as a result to the Pledge of Allegiance. Radical voices were muzzled. Even moderate civil rights activists were slandered as communists or fellow travelers. The Cold War also created pressure on the United States to live up to its democratic ideals and created new opportunities for civil rights activists to press the United States on civil rights claims. See Truman's landmark Executive Order 9981, which desegregated the armed forces in 1948. Post-war, there were many economic anxieties. In the decade of the 1930s had left deep scars. Joblessness and insecurity pushed up the suicide rate and dampened the marriage rate. Babies went unborn, pinched budgets and sagging self-esteem wrought a sexual depression. War banished the blight of depression. A faltering economy threatened to confirm the worst predictions of the doomsayers who foresaw another Great Depression. The gross national product slumped 1946 to 1947 and an epidemic of strikes swept the country.
the growth growth of organized labor had annoyed conservatives, and Congress passed the Taft-Hartley Act in 1947 over Truman's veto. This outlawed closed, which meant all union shops. It made unions liable for damages that resulted from jurisdictional disputes among themselves and required union leaders to take a non-communist oath. The CIO's Operation Dixie was aimed at unionizing southern textile workers and steel workers, but it failed because white workers feared racial mixing. Service workers proved difficult to organize, and union membership peaked in the 1950s, then began a slow decline. The Democratic administration took steps to forestall the economic downturn. They sold war factories and government installations to private businesses at fire sale prices. They secured the passage of the Employment Act of 1946, which made government policy to promote maximum employment, production, and purchasing power, and created a three-member Council of Economic Advisors to provide the president with data and recommendations on implementation. In 1944, the passage of the Servicemen's Readjustment Act, better known as the GI Bill, of rights or the GI Bill was passed. People feared the job market was not able to absorb so many returning vets. So this offered $20 a week for up to 52 weeks in compensation. There were generous provisions for sending former soldiers to school. Some 8 million veterans advanced their education as a result. Most attended technical and vocational schools, but some 2 million attended colleges uh, colleges and universities. The total spent on education was $14.5 billion in taxpayer dollars. This act enabled the Veterans Administration to guarantee $16 billion in loans for vets to buy homes, farms, and small businesses. This act nurtured a robust and long-lived economic expansion and profoundly shaped the entire history of the post-war era. The GI Bill still exists today. This is a picture titled Going to College on the GI Bill. Next, we have the 1948 election. The Republicans won control of Congress in 1946, and they gathered in Philadelphia in 1948 to choose their presidential candidate and nominated Thomas Dewey again. The Democrats chose Truman in the face of vehement opposition by the Southern delegates, who had been alienated by his strong stand in favor of the civil rights for blacks, especially his decision in 1948 to desegregate the military. Truman's nomination split the party and embittered the Southern Democrats from 13 states who met in the convention in Birmingham, Alabama, and nominated Governor Strom Thurmond of South Carolina on the state's rights party ticket. Henry Wallace also threw his hat in and was nominated at Philadelphia by a new progressive party, They opposed Truman's get-tough-with-Russia policies. With the Democrats split, Dewey's victory seemed assured. Uh, This is called the Harried Piano Player, showing Truman as a long shot for re-election in 1948. However, the president would surprise, surprise everyone by defeating his opponent, Thomas Dewey. Truman delivered over 300 speeches. He lashed out at the Taft-Hartley slave labor law and the do-nothing Republican Congress, and he whipped up support for his program of civil rights, improved labor benefits, and health insurance. And on election night, the Chicago Tribune, in its early edition, mistakenly printed, Dewey defeats Truman. This isn't the way Truman heard it, because he won the election. In the election results, Truman was swept to a stunning triumph. Thurman took 39 electoral votes in the South, Truman won 303 electoral votes, primarily from the South, the Midwest, and the West. Dewey's 189 electoral votes was principally from the East. And to make it sweeter, the Democrats regained the Congress. Truman's victory rested on the farmers, the workers, and blacks, all of whom were Republican wary. The fourth point of Truman's inaugural address, hereby after known as Point Four, was to lend money and technical aid to underdeveloped lands to help them help themselves. Truman wanted to spend millions to keep underprivileged peoples from becoming communists, rather than billions to shoot them after they became communists. The program was officially launched in 1950 to help impoverished nations in Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. This sweeping Fair Deal Reform Program was presented to Congress in 1949 for improved housing, full employment, national health insurance, higher minimum wage, better farm price supports, new Tennessee Valley authorities, and the extension of Social Security.
Most proposals were killed by opposition from congressional Republicans and Southern Democrats. The only major successes were raising the minimum wage, providing for public housing in the Housing Act of 1949, and extending the old age insurance to a more beneficiaries in the Social Security Act of 1950. There was a long economic boom from the 1950s to the 1970s, and it began in the 1950s. U.S. economic performance became the envy of the world. The national income doubled. It nearly doubled again in the 1960s. The, uh, it shot through the trillion-dollar mark in 1973, and Americans, 6% of the world population, enjoyed about 40% of the planet's wealth. This was a fantastic eruption of affluence, Prosperity underwrote social mobility and paved the way for the success of the civil rights movement. It funded vast new welfare programs like Medicare and gave Americans confidence to exercise unprecedented international leadership. Americans drank deeply from the Gilded Goblet. This made up for the sufferings of the 1930s. They were determined to get theirs while the getting was good. The middle class households were earning between $3,000 and $10,000 a year, which doubled to include 60% of Americans by the mid-1950s. 60% of the families owned their own homes in 1960, compared to 40% in the 1920s. And in 1960, nearly 90% of families owned a television. Women reaped great, great rewards as well. Urban offices and shop, shops provided employment. The great majority of new jobs created went to women, especially in the service sector, Women accounted for one quarter of the U.S. workforce at the end of World War II and nearly half by the 1990s. Yet the popular culture glorified traditional feminine roles of the homemaker and mother. This clash between the demands of suburban housewifery and the realities of employment eventually sparked the feminist revolt in the 1960s. What propelled economic growth was the Second World War itself. The USA used the war to fire up factories and rebuild the economy. Much rested on the interpinning, underpinnings of the colossal post-war military budgets, which were fueled by massive appropriations for the Korean War and defense spending. The Pentagon dollars primed the pumps of high-technology industries like aerospace, plastics, and electronics. This shows the national defense budget from 1940 to 2014. The military budget refinanced much scientific research and development called R&D and unlocked secrets of the nature of nature kept were, were the key to unleashing economic growth cheap energy fed the economic boom americans and europeans controlled the flow of abundant petroleum of the middle east to keep prices low and americans doubled their oil consumption from 1945 to 1970 as they built ribbons of highways installed air conditioning in their homes and engineering increased sixfold in electric electric electricity and generating capacity between 1945 and 1970. There were spectacular gains in worker productivity as well. In the 1950s, on average, productivity increased 3% per year. It was enhanced by the rising educational level of the workforce. 90% of the school-age population by 1970 were enrolled in educational institutions. They were better educated and better equipped workers in 1970 and could produce twice as much per hour as in 1950. Rising productivity in the 1950s and 1960s virtually doubled the average American standard of living in the post-war years. Changes in, these, in the nation's basic economic structure took place, accelerating the shift of the workforce out of agriculture. This you can pause and read. Consolidation produced giant agribusinesses able to employ costly machines. With mechanization, new fertilizers, and government subsidies and price supports, one farm worker could now feed 50 people, compared to 15 in 1940. Farmers now plowed fields in air-conditioned tractor cabs listening to stereophonic radios. And by the end of the 1900s, farmers made up only 2% of the working Americans. The population redistribution began by World War II as well. Americans had always been a people on the move, and after 1945, 30 million people changed residences every year. Families especially felt the strain of separating. The popularity of advice books on child rearing, like Dr. Spock, came about as a result of separation from family. In the fluid post-war neighborhoods, friendships were hard to sustain, and mobility extracted a high human cost in loneliness and isolation. The growth of the Sun Belt took place, the 15-state area from Virginia through Florida, Texas, Arizona, and California. It had a population growth rate, rate twice that of the Northeast. Populate, California, by 1963, was the most populous state in USA. South and Southwest was a new frontier. 
The distribution of population increase in 1958 can be shown on the map in your book, 35.4. Federal funds were the key to the prosperity of the South and Western states. Annually, they received $4,444 billion more than the North and Midwest, and a new economic war between the states was shaping up. This had big effects on the presidency and the House of Representatives.